Hello and a warm welcome to everyone joining us today for this webinar, What's Buzzing in Our Quarries. I'm really excited that this is also a partner event for European Minerals Day, which is a pan-European awareness initiative by the European Mineral Sector for Biodiversity. Um, biodiversity is a strong element of this, so very happy for this to be a, a partner event today. I hope you're ready to be inspired and motivated by what you hear and see today. We can definitely promise you some beautiful pictures, some hard hitting facts, which, which I'm sure will make everyone sit up, and some great examples of on the ground action that's happening in quarries right now all around Europe. And also, more importantly, is lay down the challenge for everyone to get involved, everyone to see how they can support pollinators uh, in their quarries, in their cement plants, and even at home in your garden. So uh, to give some context to the background of this webinar and the work that the SEM Bureau Biodiv uh, Biodiversity Task Force has been doing, I'm really happy to introduce Alexandra Silva. Um, with over 18 years of experience in the cement industry, Alexander leads biodiversity and nature at Cecil um, and coordinates and ex I'm sorry, ex executes several project task force development of biodiversity management plans, implementation of quarry rehabilitation projects, stakeholder engagement, scientific partnerships, sustainable development and ESG reporting. She has a very big remit. But also, Alexandra is very importantly the chair of the Biodiversity Task Force at SEM Bureau. So I'm really happy to hand over the floor to Alexandra. Um, if I could ask um, our other panelists to close their cameras um, so that we don't have too much bandwidth and everyone has good connection. Um, and Alexandra, over to you. Thanks, Caroline. Good morning to all. And thanks, Cass, for this uh, beautiful presentation. I don't know if I'm a very important person, but I think the importance is our task force that's been working a long time. I think this is the importance for, uh, for biodiversity all together as a team. So today it's up to me to give you an overview or a brief overview about our roadmap that was launched last year. Then we will uh, speak a little bit about pollinators with other panelists. So I just want to share my screen and give you some slides. Just let me check if this is in okay. Are you seeing my screen, the slides? Yes, we can, Alexandra. Okay, thank you, so perfect. So as I said, it's up to me to give you an overview about the biodiversity roadmap. So we are sharing with you the same bureau and the task force uh, vision for uh, biodiversity in our quarries and in the surroundings in the coming years. So one of our ambitions with this roadmap is to contribute to helping biodiversity loss during the whole life cycle of the quarry and especially to the rehabilitation process. Um, our actions and targets that we define in our roadmap include and aims to, to contribute also especially to the sustainable goal on 15 life on lands, to the decade ecosystem restoration, to the habitats and directives, to the initiative of pollinators, where uh, we have our dedicated webinar today to, the, to this group of species, the biodiversity strategy, and the regulation on invasive, invasive species. So it's just important to highlight that these regulations and initiatives were the basis or the framework um for defining the actions and targets that we included in, in this roadmap so this was the point to start um when sam bureau published this roadmap one of one of the goals was was to share our vision the cement industry vision to biodiversity for the coming years and this roadmap outlines actions and targets until 2030 and they are grouping four important focus areas but it's not only to share a vision that this roadmap aims to, it's also a good tool, and this is for me a, a, night, a highlight of this roadmap, it's a tool to help guide and influence companies to manage biodiversity, and especially to inspire collaboration between all of us, between the cement sector, and of course with other stakeholders, stakeholders such as regulation, nature conservation associations, 
academia, especially, and also political institutions. So this is one of the one of the highlights of this roadmap. It should be a tool to help and inspire the cement sector. Also, with this roadmap, we want to contribute to the global goal of nature positive. And how can we do that? We can do that by enhancing the ecological values of our quarried areas. We can protect and restore the ecosystems. And we, with all of this, uh, try to um, deliver a sustainable growth in, a, in harmony with the natural world. So this is uh, what we built with our old map. This is our vision uh, regarding the cement sector and biodiversity for the future. So the scope of this roadmap is focused on limestone quarries, uh, limestone quarries that provide the raw materials for the production of cement. However, we encourage companies to extend the application of these actions and targets to other extractive sectors, such as aggregate quarries. So it's up to each company to decide whether to extend the scope of this roadmap and include aggregate quarries or other materials that we need for the production of cement. So just to give you an overview about the roadmap and how it's structured. Um, so the, we have four focus areas, which it, within which focus areas we have a small introduction. We define a vision, what we want to achieve in each focus area and the actions and targets until 2030. And to monitor the implementation of the roadmap, we define some KPIs to help measure the progress of this roadmap. So this is how our uh, roadmap is structured. So as I said, the roadmap outlines actions and targets until 2030 that are grouped in four focus areas. The first one is ecosystem rehabilitation and ecosystem service. The second one, uh, a pollinators initiative from the European Union. The third one, invasive species. And here we only focus in the roadmap on plants, not animals. And the fourth, the fourth focus area is protected species. So you will see in the document several actions and targets that are divided or grouped in these four focus areas that we consider the most relevant for the salmon sector. So we also identify a set of indicators to monitoring the implementation of the roadmap. Um, in this webinar, it's not the goal, but I want to describe all of them. But just to point out that um, for each focus area, we have one or more KPIs to measure the progress of the roadmap. Some KPIs we already defined in the, in the past in the task force, but we included to follow up in the roadmap. And say this here was the starting point or the year that we start to collect um, all the KPIs that we define uh, within the roadmap. So, what we've done so far, or what were the main actions that we did since we launched the, the webinar? Of course, promoting the roadmap is very important internally with our members in San Diego and also externally. So we participate in some conference webinars. We we had, I think it was last year in Spain, in the Society of Collective Restoration in Europe, the conference. We promoted in the UEUBAB platform um, in the workshop about nature positive. We had the press there, and we published some articles um, in the Cement Oregon and the World Cement Magazine also to promote in webinar. We have done some internal webinar. For example, we did this year an internal to explain and how to collect and monitoring the KPIs within our roadmap within our members. And also by including internal and external webinars, um, the idea, and this is one of the actions in the roadmap, is to enhance the collaboration between the cement sectors and also to share and to increase our knowledge. So we already done an internal webinar that was related to temporary nature or temporary um, habitats in our queries. We did it this year in the beginning of May. And this is the first one. So I'm very happy to, to start doing that within the, the San Bureau Biodiversity Roadmap. This is the first external webinar and we dedicated this to pollinators. Um, so this is some of the communication actions that we've done so far. I have to say that one of the secrets of this roadmap is the biodiversity members. Uh, Caroline is one of them. She's our, our lovely moderator today. Um, and this year was a work around two years. So it's, it's possible because it was done by the task force. 
of biodiversity, people that work within the, uh, the industry, people that know the challenge and where we want to go in biodiversity. So just to highlight this, this was designed by the Sembiro Biodiversity Task Force of the European Cement Association. So many thanks to all the participants participants on this. I know that it wasn't easy. Uh, this is not, not our, our first job, but um, it was very, very good. Um, and it was very interesting to work within these two years to develop this roadmap with them. So congrats to all. So just to some acknowledge, of course, a lot of people contribute to this roadmap, uh, but we also had the collaboration of um, beyond the Biodiversity Task Force. We had the collaboration and received several comments from biodiversity um, for, regarding the biodiversity roadmap from BirdLife and also for the society ecological restoration, the, uh, the CERF, sorry, the society ecological restoration of Europe. So they also participate and it, it gave some inputs to our roadmap. So thank you all for, for the inputs and our work. So this is done. Just to give you an overview so of the map, so I will pass to Caroline and the other to start with the other presentations. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Alessandra. That was a fantastic run through of, of the biodiversity roadmap. Um, I just want to echo it's you know it's really unique for a sector how to have such a dedicated roadmap on biodiversity, and I, I think it's something that that we um, as the cement sector, and I know a lot of our our companies also span into the aggregate side. It, it's something that we should be really proud of. So thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, I just want to point out that this session will be recorded, um, and we will slide uh, share the slides later on. Um, we welcome questions throughout. After each of the next speakers, we will have a short question and answer session. So please use the Q&A function that you will find at the bottom of your screen. However, now um, it's time to test your knowledge. You have to participate in, in this web webinar as well. We, we want to get a, a bit of a view for, for the education that you have around, around pollinators. So we have a, a small number of questions throughout. Um, if I could ask for uh, the first question to be shared, here we go. So what are the main pollinators that we find in Europe? Um, you can tick one or more options, so please fire away. Not surprising that bees are, are out in, in the lead. I think bees are certainly the pollinators that get by far the most media attention. Okay, so mo most of you have now answered. Um, I would like to say that actually all of these are pollinators in Europe. Um, let me... Yeah, yeah, share the results. So, um, like I say, um, bees are often often the ones that, that are talked about. And, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that in, in the next talk. But actually, um, there's a wide range of species that, that assist in, in pollination um, activities. And uh, we, we picked up Europe because as we, we go further out, we get species such as, as birds as well, um, and even bats. So um, this is just uh, just for Europe. Thank you very much for partaking. Now you'll know that all of these can be pollinators in a European context. So um, if we can close that, please. Okay, so now let's delve more into the world of pollinators. Some of you may still not be too sure about what the word pollinator actually means. What, what are pollinators and why are they so significant that we've dedicated a whole webinar to them? To the answer these questions, um, please let me introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Adam van Bergen. Adam is an ecologist who focuses on insect species interactions and communities and the relationship between their biodiversity and ecosystem processes and human activities. He's a research director at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment and is an actively involved in the science policy interface at national and international level. 
An example of his involvement as a lead author of the IPVES, this is Intergovernmentary Panel on Biodiversity in Ecosystem Services, Global Pollination Assessment, published back in 2016, which will really be the focus of today's presentation. So thank you so much, um, Adam, for joining us. Um, I'm sure we're all going to be so much wiser on, on the topic of pollinators after your speak, uh, after your presentation. So I would now like to hand over to you. Thanks very much, Karen, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here today to present, so thank you very much for that generous introduction. As you've just mentioned, the bulk of the slides I'm going to be sharing you to, uh, with you today come from the work of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and its assessment report on pollinators, pollination and food production that was published back in 2016, although many of the findings remain, uh, remain current. This slide just gives an image of what that entails. You can see in the top right, the uh, all the authors of this report, uh, which I was privileged to be a part of. And in the bottom, you can see the, the plenary of the IPBES with all the member states. And you can see the negotiations going on between policymakers and uh, the author uh, group with regard to the final wording of the summary for policymakers. So that gives you a flavor of the sort of effort that went into this report. Uh, today, I've divided the talk really into three parts. So I'm going to introduce to you, and you probably already know to some degree, of the very uh, the various values um, that pollinators and pollination bring to human societies. We're going to highlight something about their status and trends, and then I'll mention uh, some of the threats that they face. So, moving straight on to values. As Caroline has just mentioned, uh, actually, often people think of pollinators, they think of the honeybee, but there are many, many uh, pollinator species around the world. Yes, the vast majority of them are insects. Um, worldwide, there are 20,000 uh, known species of bee. And in a single country like France, for example, where I'm based, there are uh, nearly a thousand species of bee. Um, but apart from bees, as has already been mentioned in the survey, there's a high diversity of hoverflies and other flies. Um, there are uh, butterflies and moths, uh, beetles and other insects that are vital for performing pollination uh, functions and services. But also worldwide, uh, not so much in Europe, but in, uh, for example, the global south, many vertebrate species also play a role. So bats and birds, certainly, but also in some systems, some very unusual pollinators occur whether those are lizards and other reptiles or um, uh, small mammals. And this diversity of pollinators worldwide brings a wide range of benefits. More than 75% of the leading food crop types uh, globally uh, rely on animal pollination services for the stability and production of their yields. And almost 90% of the world's flowering plant species rely, at least in part, on animal pollination to secure their reproduction. In terms of the crops uh, that uh, uh, su support human diets, the, uh, the things that provide the staple foods, uh, wheat, rice, and cassava, are actually wind pollinated or self pollinated and don't actually rely uh, on animal pollination services. But it's the, the fruits, the vegetables, the, uh, the nuts, and the seed crops that provide crucial dietary diversity and valuable nutrients that rely greatly on animal pollination services, either to a high degree, such as you see there, as examples, or to a moderate degree, as you see on the left. And this includes some really important things as well to human beings, such as coffee and chocolate. And so that's always good to remember. And these crops have considerable economic value. This slide shows the annual market value linked to pollinators in 2015 US dollars. And you can see from the map that there are uh, hotspots of economic value around the world, illustrated by the red coloration, uh, where there's a, a great deal of economic reliance on these insect pollinated, uh, pollinated plants, uh, noting in the Mediterranean region, for example, and in Europe quite widely, but also in places like India and East Asia. And as I mentioned, these, uh, these insect pollinated or animal pollinated crops are a key source of the vitamins and minerals that support healthy human diets, the sort of five a day that often governments recommend people eat of fruits and vegetables. And these maps in the center illustrate, again with red, the hot spots in the world where 
the uh, supply of crucial nutrients or vitamins is very much delivered by insect pollinated uh, crops, such as vitamin A on the left, iron in the middle, and folate on the right. So it really is a crucial service underpinning our well-being. And going beyond ecological value and going beyond uh, the value to agriculture, economy and human health, we also realise through this assessment that there's considerable uh, sociocultural values attached to pollinators and the plants that they, uh, that they support. And here in this slide, you can see some examples where countries actually use either the pollinators themselves or the plants they pollinate as national symbols. And throughout history, pollinators uh, have been sources of inspiration uh, culturally. On the left, you can see uh, st uh, stingless beekeeping portrayed in, as part of the Mayan Codex. In the middle, you can see uh, a, a representation of the three bee motif adopted by a pope in Europe. And on the right, you can see a celebration of pollinators in Islamic art. And this significance continues today through activities uh, such as beekeeping, but also there are considerable uh, levels of um, uh, significance for indigenous and local knowledge systems around the world. And this slide gives an example uh, of the Guna Mola, of the Guna people in Latin America, who uh, this, this represents uh, um, a bee and a, a butterfly spirit that has considerable uh, spiritual importance for this people. And this was evaluated as part of a, a sub-assessment in the Eight Bears Assessment, and this, this informed our work. So moving on now to the status and trends. We'll start with the managed honeybee, one that is most is very well known to people. And actually, over the last decades, globally, globally, we've seen an increase in, in the numbers of, uh, of uh, uh, honeybee colonies worldwide. But actually, this pattern masks considerable regional variation around the planet. And we've noted considerable losses in North America, and many European countries. Uh, from time to time. The key message here is you must understand that managed honeybees are managed by people and it's the socioeconomic activity of beekeeping, whether that's for things like honey or for delivering crop pollination services, it's that that really drives the fluctuation in numbers of honeybee colonies. However, superimposed on that are things like problems to do with diseases or to do with climatic variation and that can also cause things to become difficult for beekeepers uh, from a socioeconomic perspective, but really they are semi-domesticated and are somewhat like livestock. When we think about the wild insects though, uh, the various bees that I mentioned around the world and hoverflies and butterflies, uh, we reviewed in the assessment a huge body of published work as shown by some examples here, and we're able to distill some key messages from that work. And one of those is that declines in diversity and the occurrence of uh, certain bees and hoverflies and butterflies have been observed in Europe and North America in particular, where most of the data comes from. Also, we were able to say that uh, greater than 40% of bee species globally were threatened according to internationally reckoned IUCN uh, criteria. And then uh, I think this was published in 2015. It was the first European red list of bees, the first continental assessment of its kind. And that found that in Europe, about 9% of European bee and butterfly species were threatened. But it's important to note for at least half of the species evaluated, there was a lack of data. And so it was actually impossible to say in the European context, which uh, the, the, the true level of threat to the populations. And that lack of data is true for many other regions around the world, which precludes a, a detailed assessment of status. Nonetheless, there are many scientific reports uh, of declines from different regions. This gives you a concrete example from Great Britain, which has got one of the, uh, uh, the richest data sets uh, in the world. And it shows in the, in the blue line there, the average trend for nearly 400 species of wild bee and hoverfly over the decades. You can see that, gen uh, that general decline there. And the bar chart on the right actually illustrates um, the pattern uh, amongst different species uh, in terms of whether they are strongly declining, weakly declining, or indeed increasing. They're always winners and losers in environmental changes, and you can see that there. We mentioned at the beginning the vertebrates, the bats, the birds, and the other things. And indeed, in the assessment, we assess their diversity and their occurrence as well. And again, using these IUCN criteria, the, the pie charts, the, you can see the threatened species are around 70% worldwide. 
and these are these uh, shadings in uh, warm colours there. And actually that level rises when you consider island ecosystems. Typically island ecosystems are more vulnerable to environmental changes, so the threat rises there. So you see these patterns in, in, in decline, in loss and so on, but what is it that's been linked to these, these trends? So there's a, a range, there are in fact multiple pressures uh, impacting on pollinators, sometimes negatively or mostly negatively, but sometimes positively as well. Land use changes, the transformation of the land use from one to another kind, the type or the intensity of land management, the use of uh, chemicals such as insecticides, herbicides and fungicides. Diseases are a problem in many cases, and this can be exacerbated. Uh, diseases that attack bees, for example, by uh, this can be exacerbated by intensive bee, uh, beekeeping activities uh, where the, the scale of beekeeping can uh, allow uh, diseases to propagate. Climate change, of course, is becoming a major problem. Invasive alien species, depending on where you are in the world and which organisms you're talking about, can be a major problem. And sources of pollution as well are actually less well evaluated, but they do exist as a potential risk to pollinators. Actually, following the IPBES assessment, uh, we were asked to uh, reconsider the picture of threats from a more regional uh, uh, focus. Um, and you can see on the on the left side the various pressures that I've just given an indication of, and on the right you can see the various continents and the global on, on the far right. And the size of these bubbles in this chart indicates the level of importance of a given pressure to pollination in terms of impact, and the shading, the darker the shading, the more confident we are. And the key messages here really are that there is regional variation around the world in the causes of pollinator decline, but land management and landscape structure are probably the most important factors across the board for pollinator decline. Coming behind that quickly are the use of pesticides and climate change, but we still remain uncertain, scientifically speaking, about many effects due to data lacks. Another thing about the threats that I want you to take away is that some of these factors can combine in their impact. Um, and this chart shows now, if you look at the horizontal black arrows where you've listed various pressures impacting pollinators and the vertical arrows show at different levels of organization from the gene to the community and to the, to the species level, how uh, these things may combine and, and, and cause changes in pollinators and pollinator functions. So there's a real risk of multiple impacts combining in their effect. So to summarize this part, we see in the IPBES assessment well-documented declines in some wild managed pollinators. These things, these pollinators provide us with a broad range of benefits, socioculturally, economically, ecologically. The pollinators are facing multiple threats, but there are a wide range of policy and practice response options to protect pollinators. These exist and they are outlined in that report in great detail and elsewhere. And I'll just touch on a, a few of those uh, just now for you. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is that policy has responded following the publication of the IPBES assessment. Uh, the Convention of Biological Diversity and International Treaty decides to adopt the findings uh, completely in, uh, of the IPBES report. And this stimulated uh, a raft of national pollinator strategies springing up around the world, um, a coalition of the willing in, in the form of promote pollinators of national uh, uh, governments that are wanting to engage with one another on this issue. And of course, you will hear in a moment uh, directly the, uh, the EU pollinator initiative as well um, and how that's uh, been evolved. And why should we care about this? Well, the, the fact is that people care about pollinators, whether that's the public, the media, and that means that businesses and industry should also care about this issue, as I can show you on that slide. So what can we do about it? What can you do about it as an industry? And I just wanted to highlight a few points. Mainstreaming biodiversity into your business strategies and, and planning. Consider, avoid and mitigate the risks to pollinators, in this case specifically, arising from your activities. Look to conserve and restore green infrastructure. Um, which is a network of habitats that pollinators can use and move between across agricultural and urban landscapes. You can improve the quality of habitat in your sites for pollinators by planting the right things. You can re-establish wildflower areas or flowering shrubs, try to focus on native species. 
It's good to tolerate the emergence of weeds that emerge uh, spontaneously. These are among the best food plants for pollinators, things like dandelions and thistles. Leave areas of unvegetated ground, dead wood, sandy areas that provide nest sites, and intervene in, in these semi-natural areas that you establish less often, cut them less, mow them less, and if you do, do it after flowering. Engagement with national pollinator strategies and action plans is a must. And try maybe and join with academics and other actors who right now are developing long-term monitoring plans in the European context for pollinators, perhaps by opening your sites to future monitoring activities. And you can discover online advice in many countries around Europe and uh, at the European level on how to restore your habitats. And I was very pleased uh, to look at the biodiversity roadmap of Sembro uh, yesterday and noted the explicit mention of pollinators within that. So that's very welcome. So it just remains to me to thank you for your attention and to once more acknowledge the contribution of everyone involved uh, in the IPBES assessment report, particularly those with indigenous and local knowledge uh, uh, that include the Guna people and uh, the, the Guna Mola I showed you earlier. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Adam. That was a fantastic overview and I'm sure we're all really, really well educated and far more wiser now about pollinators. So thank you so much. Um, we have, uh, we're just, we're running a little, little behind, but we've got a question here. Um, I saw a hand raised, but I can't see it now. I think Marina, did you have a question? Uh, or you can type it in the chat, uh, in the Q&A section, please. I was, um, I thought that was great to have the list of actions for business. I'm sure we will take that away and, and use that. And it was really good to see um, the bit you had about the spontaneous weedy species, because mm. um, I think, um, and also the bare ground, because I think this is where quarries offer such a, a unique opportunity, because we have such a, a large amount of bare ground, which sort of naturally colonizes and we get these really nectar pollen rich um, species coming in um, which is which is really good um, can I ask you if I mean a, a lot of I think a lot of the quarry um, opportunities are often spontaneous and there's not much we need to do we just need to let the quarry work with nature but if there was one specific action um, that we could do either in our quarries or even in our cement plants? What, what would you say that would be? I think, um, I mean, you've already said it really, the, the key point would be to uh, look at your quarry site and decide where exactly in that site you were able to let nature go and rewild. Um, look at spontaneous uh, vegetation coming up, but also you can enhance it. So sometimes grasses will come in and take over the area and they're not really offering a great deal for insect pollinators. So you do need to take a look at it, take a stock take. What are the flowering plants that are coming up? As I said, things like dandelions and thistles, which often sprout up, are really excellent. But you might need to also invest in some wildflower seed mixtures. In calcareous systems, limestone systems, there's a very rich flora that can support pollinators and they're really important habitat potentially for pollinators. So take a stock of your situation, look to recreate some of the sort of natural limestone habitats that you get in the wild in areas where are peripheral to your production. Um, and uh, yeah, and see what happens. There's plenty of advice on seed mixtures. Look at the NGOs in, your, in the state you're working in. Um, there's lots of associations out there that can offer advice on, on that sort of subject. What's the right things to put in place to support pollinators? Perfect. No, I think that that's really good advice because I know some of the more commercial seed mixes don't really don't really hit the bar yet quite with with the wild seeds. So to to pick up with with we'll have specific uh, specific flora for limestone environments. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so no much. Thank you very much. So um, we now have another question for for the audience. Um, so if I could ask for for that to be launched, please. Here we go. So how how well have you been listening? What are the main causes of pollinator decline? And you can tick one or two or all of them. Let's see see where the knowledge lies.
you've been listening well. Results look good. Great, we will, we will close it there. So um, if you could please show the results. And um, so all of these um, are causing pollinator decline um, with of course uh, land use change and um, agriculture management and pesticide are, are very, very significant, but all of them are causing. And, and this, this doesn't just lie for pollinators, this goes above and beyond. Land use change really is the biggest driver of, of biodiversity decline. So we will, we will close that now. Um, so we've heard the science side, um, and now we're going to move on to the policy side and hear more about the pollinator initiative, which is led by the European Commission. So to guide us through this, I would like to introduce Vujadan Kovacevic. Um, Vujadan joined the European Commission in 2014 and is currently a policy officer for biodiversity at the Directorate General for Environment for the European Commission. His responsibilities include the development and implementation of the EU biodiversity policy, notably the first ever EU action on the conservation of wild pollinating insects, known as the EU Pollinator Initiative. He is a biologist with experience in ecology, renewable energy and environmental economics, having completed two masters, one science in, bio in biology at the University of Zagreb, and of environmental science, economics, and natural resource management at, ooh, crikey, Fangingen University. Not sure I pronounced that quite right. But Fujidan, so great to have you. Um, you've been a, a strong, um, a strong stakeholder and a collaborator with the sector for a long time. So it's fantastic to have you here. Um, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Caroline. I hope that you can hear me and yeah. see me, and that you see the presentation. We can, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. And of course, thanks to San Bureau for the opportunity to present to the extractive sector what we do on pollinators and, of course, how this links to your activities and uh, what you can do uh, to help pollinator conservation and, of course, what we can do from the Commission side to help you to do that. Uh, the introduction was already quite comprehensive by Caroline, so I will skip personal introduction and go right into the content. So it was already mentioned by Adam and by Caroline. So we have a new action for wild pollinating insects. This is important to note that uh, EU Pollinators Initiative is dealing only with wild species. So honeybee and all other managed species are excluded. We have separate policies at EU level for that. Here you have just a short history uh, of the EU action pollinators. Uh, we adopted the initiative in 2018. Uh, recently, we celebrated fifth anniversary. And uh, this is a so-called soft policy. It's a communication from the Commission to the Parliament, to the Council, and to other EU institutions on the plan strategy from the Commission side, an action plan, how to, together with member states and stakeholders, address the underlying problem. We reviewed the policy in 2021 and we revised uh, the policy uh, also quite recently in January this year, coming with a revised, stronger action framework. Uh, but the objectives, long term objectives of the initiative towards 2030 stay the same. And of course, the main objective is to tackle the pollinator decline and more precisely to reverse the decline by 2030. Just to mention that uh, right from the beginning, we had quite a strong engagement from basically all actors. Uh, this includes interinstitutional feedback at EU level, at national level. So all the key institutions are uh, actively involved and supportive. And we also had quite comprehensive uh, consultation of stakeholders when we were reviewing and revising the policy and of course developing it in 2018, but also quite strong involvement through our expert groups, commission expert groups, in the implementation now of the action framework. Here you have all the links uh, to the key documents, so you can definitely uh, use it for more information later on. And of course, this initiative comes in the framework of the EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, and of course, the biodiversity strategy is part of the 
uh, broader framework, which is European Green Deal. All, all these initiatives together are uh, set to bring EU on the path of biodiversity recovery. Besides the initiative, which I mentioned is a soft policy, is a communication, uh, the Commission recently also adopted a more, let's say, hard policy. Uh, we proposed a legislation on nature restoration in June last year. Uh, this proposal is currently discussed in the Parliament and the Council. Within the proposal, there is a provision, an article on pollinators, uh, and the target within this article is to reverse the point of decline by 2030. So while we have an overall framework, which is not non-legislative, here we have a legislative element within the nature restoration law, which will work together with that non-legislative part. It's not just targeted until 2030. Uh, the same provision also stipulates that member states need to achieve also an increasing trend of pollinator populations after 2030 until we reach satisfactory levels. And these satisfactory levels of population sizes and diversity are yet to be determined. And uh, equally important, there is also obligation for monitoring. We need very good data information to inform that target, to assess if member states uh, are reaching it. This is all in the discussion. This is not yet a law, it's still a proposal. And we expect, of course, uh, to see the discussions in the Council of the Parliament and uh, some indicative timeline is end of the year, beginning of next year for a potential adoption of this act. Now, together, provisions in the Nature Restoration Law and the EU Policy Initiative, as well as many other initiatives on the European Green Deal, form one package we, which we call a new deal for pollinators. We really are confident that this is a game changer for the conservation of wild pollinating insects in Europe. But of course, for that EU Policy Initiative alone is not enough. We need to have proposal for Nature Restoration Law adopted with adequate ambition as well as to have all other initiatives adopted and well implemented. The issue of political decline is uh, well uh, in the hearts and the minds of the society. I think that is clear uh, to everybody. And the, the latest, let's say, the pulse of the society on this topic was also uh, being presented in the ECI on Save Bees and Farmers. ECI stands for the European Citizen Initiative. It's basically a petition citizen petition at EU level. So more than a million signatures were collected uh, across U Europe, across member states, calling for much stronger reinforced actions on protecting bees and other pollinators, as well as ensuring transition of agriculture to a sustainable model, which will work for bees and farmers as well. I will give just a short kind of helicopter overview of the pollinators initiative. It's a uh, too comprehensive for a 15 minutes presentation, but I hope that a few uh, slides will help you to get first cues, and then of course you can invest uh, and explore yourself more later on. We have 42 actions across three pillars. First, we try to improve knowledge. We are at the same time tackling the cause of point of decline, and we are more mobilizing wider society and showing a strategic approach across all stakeholder communities. On improving knowledge, establishing a monitoring system and a set of indicators through which we can target uh, and assess uh, the progress that we are making is absolutely fundamental. If we don't know where we are and where we are going, it's very hard, of course, to put actions on how to come there. Of course, a basic and applied research, we are doing red list assessments to understand better which species are uh, at the risk of extinction, which need basically urgent help. We are also currently mapping key pollinator areas. This is also very pertinent to the work of the extractive sector. And of course, capacity building uh, across different aspects, experts, tools, data infrastructure, and so on. On taking pollinator decline, Adam already mentioned the major drivers of pollinator decline, and we are uh, basically addressing all of them within the action framework. There is an overall work on conservation, which includes species action plans, work in protected areas, of course, uh, use of a life instrument for conservation actions on the ground. And we also introduced a concept of buzz lines. Buzz lines is basically a connectivity network for pollinators. So 
it's a basically excuse me uh, it's it's basically uh, a green infrastructure through the eyes of pollinators and such a baseline concept would be integrated into the wider networks like green infrastructure networks or trans european uh, nature network and it's also very pertinent to the actions of the extractive sector uh, because uh, the decision where you uh, extract or uh, where you restore following the extraction and how of course uh, it will be very important to make this decision in line with such uh, strategic networks at, at higher level we of course address agriculture pesticides uh, environmental pollutants in general we are also looking in urban areas it's not just agriculture uh, and forest landscapes invasive alien species and also climate change of course, the Uplantis Initiative is too small of an initiative to address a global challenge of climate change, but we are integrating pollinator conservation needs within the EU European climate change policies, in particular identifying vulnerable zones and uh, basically assisting species to adapt or to move towards north or to other areas where the climate is still beneficial for them. And we are also addressing light pollution. This is the actions for light, addressing light pollution is mostly the competence lies with member states, with national, regional, local authorities. However, we are helping them with guidelines, uh, tools, and support. And the third pillar of the action framework is on mobilizing society and strategic planning. We work uh, very intensively on ensuring that citizens, uh, civil society as a whole, is well engaged, uh, foster, of course, actions that they, that they can do uh, with a particular focus on younger generations. So this is the problem that will uh, most strongly affect the upcoming generation. Of course, we have a quite comprehensive framework for engaging businesses as well. We produced more than a dozen guidelines, guidance documents very detailed, very targeted, uh, and hopefully very effective to bring different business sectors on board, including the extractive sectors. I will say a bit more about that in the next slide. What is important is to ensure strategic approach at all levels. So EU Policy Initiative is an EU level uh, strategy, but we need also to translate all the objectives and actions of the EU action at national level, but then also regional local plans. This is absolutely critical most of the actions, tangible uh, actions on the ground will be taking place at local and regional level, of course, and we have to make sure that they take place in such a way that together they can form, uh, of course, that we can utilize synergies and that we can also form uh, a framework which can be impactful, which can uh, turn the things around, uh, and that, of course, means reversing the decline. We also actively engage stakeholders across the board, uh, non-governmental organization uh, in the environmental dimension, but also industry as associations. And we are also fostering uh, to the extent possible global action within the framework of the CBD. I mentioned businesses and different guidelines. So one of the guidance that we produced and uh, Caroline here was one of the contributing authors. Uh, is for the extractive sectors. Uh, what we, I will just briefly outline what is the content of the guideline. Uh, there is no time, of course, to present in details, but here you have a link and you can definitely uh, search for more information later on. In the guideline, we, ex we explain why we produce the guidance in the first place. And the reason is obvious, we want to engage businesses and of course ensure, facilitate their active role in actions for uh, reversing pollinator decline. Also, why this uh, business sector should care about that. So why should extractive industry uh, do anything about pollinators when we know that it does not depend on pollinators, like, for example, food sector? And of course, there are different reasons. And I think Adam already put it quite succinctly and quite effectively. Because the society cares, uh, I would uh, go, uh, yes, further than that and complement by saying our well-being depends on, on pollinators and uh, ecosystem services they deliver. And this goes much wider than just crop pollination, which is usually uh, outlined. There is much more to that. Pollination in natural ecosystems, 
is a supported service for many other regulating services. So it's it's a kind of cascading issue. If uh, insects will be gone, uh, which pollinate, many of the functions in the ecosystem will also cease to exist, affecting us quite dearly. There are other reasons why uh, extractive sector should care, uh, including reputational, uh, of course, uh, risks uh, because of the society which cares, but also financing compliance with the legislation, uh, marketing, uh, and so on. Now, what needs to be done and how? Uh, so we outlined this uh, really well in the, in the guidelines. What is critical is mitigation hierarchy. So the first thing is to avoid harmful impacts. And that means basically selection of sites. We should really not uh, select sites which are already hotspots for biodiversity or pollinator diversity. Uh, once we choose the site, we should minimize and mitigate potential impacts and only as a very, very last option offset. So if we need to affect certain site, which has significant benefits pointers, we should really uh, uh, offset at the end, but this is very, very last options. Basically, this means that we think about impacts before we do any uh, extractive activity, during extract, uh, extraction, and then, of course, after, how do we restore to, of course, get as many benefits as possible? Absolutely critical is to monitor and evaluate at different stages what is the impact, what are the outputs and outcomes of uh, restoration actions or conservation protection actions. We need to understand what, what was the initial state and what was the final state, how did we reach it, and how our activities had an impact. It's important to also engage public, uh, also engage local community in particular, because they will be most affected and collaborate with stakeholders. Stakeholders can bring a lot to the sector, for example, in terms of monitoring. If companies do not have expertise for monitoring, they can hire, of course, uh, stakeholders, being it academia or environmental NGOs. This is quite, quite uh, important. There are other actions than just doing uh, certain things on the extraction site itself in terms of protection, conservation, restoration. Uh, the businesses can also look through the whole value chain and promote pollinator conservation as such. They can do many things at their headquarters, for example, maintaining, uh, for example, land around headquarters are pollinator friendly, or the whole environmental management of the company will indirectly also impact pollinators. So this is all outlined in the guidelines as well. And uh, finally, we provided also some case studies and examples inside to give a bit of a flavor how this uh, could look like on the ground. And we hope that, of course, businesses will take up the guidance, uh, provide feedback, and we encourage you to do so. And uh, of course, if necessary, we will look to revise it and improve it and update it. With that, I would like to finish and just providing here a few more links for information. We have a policy page that you can visit, but also very important and uh, probably the most useful for you will be you point of information hive, where we have all the guidelines and all different documents that can help stakeholders to engage in the policy actions. So uh, stay uh, with us, implement the guidance, give us uh, feedback to it, uh, and of course, uh, give us also suggestions how we can further improve uh, partnership with the extractive sectors to make sure that their contribution to the reverse of the decline of pointers is also impactful. So thank you a lot, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic um, overview of, of the guidance. And I, I have to say, um, working in in the sector and in business for for a long time it's fantastic how comprehensive the pollinator initiative and the information hive is um often uh within the sector um we're, we're kind of wading around in the dark trying to find clear guidance and clear information so thank you so much for for having we we just need this for every other species group now i think <laughs> so that's the challenge <laughs> the challenge to you um do we have any questions please feel free to use the the q a um we, we've got one question which um Perhaps um, Adam might like to come back in for as well. Again, it's about this specific. Um, so where, where, where is a good place to go to find information about the specific flora um, in the limestone environment? Um, I think this is possibly quite, quite a difficult 
question because usually this is split over many different academic papers but um, if you have any ideas about where people can go to, to learn about the specific flora. Um, <clears throat> I've been racking my uh, head on this one because there's been some chat and I tried to give some pointers. I think really uh, there are uh, growing resources online through various associations that have an interest in this area. I've put in the chat an example from France and one from the UK, but there are, there are associations in every country interested in the conservation of pollinators and providing information, fact sheets and species lists on, on, on the mixtures of plants for different environments. So I'm afraid there's a little bit of hunting that's to be done. I can't think maybe rujadin has got a better idea of a a centralized European one. Ultimately, I think some of this is in the future where we begin bring together this information through various projects and initiatives that are going on to have an aggregator of this knowledge. But really, I think my advice would be to go reach out to your, uh, your local university, see if there's any people there working on the topic and look uh, in the country you're located in at associations with that interest and just drill down on the web and see if they've got any resources and any contacts that you can engage with because those are the people who are really working on the ground to try and improve habitat for pollinators. Thank you. I'm happy to come in as well on this, Caroline. Please uh, do. We have two um, kind of work streams in this regard. We are going to identify, let's say, plants which are important for pollinators uh, across different taxonomic groups. And this work we plan to already start uh, next year. It's one of the actions in the action framework. And the idea is to support uh, citizen actions because citizens also ask us, okay, so what should I plant in my garden that uh, I provide a uh, whole season, uh, basically a diversity of forage for pollinators, not just one species. And uh, we definitely need information per biogeographical regions in that regard. Uh, so it's not going to be the same for all citizens, but the same applies to, of course, different business sectors. And I think the extractive sector is also an important case to consider in this work. So first is the information. So what kind of species, what kind of vegetation communities we should be restoring in this kind of uh, climate and environment? And second thing is, where do I get the seeds? So how do I go about it? So we had some consideration of that in the past. We need to reflect further. We had also uh, a bit of contact with some companies, seed producing companies, to see how much of capacity and interest and in the market is there to actually produce seeds of wild flora. There are companies, but uh, at EU level, uh, definitely not so, not such a large capacity to produce seeds for such a large scale action. So we definitely need to reflect further how the capacity for seed production could be uh, improved in that regard. It's currently quite fragmented, small, decentralized, but we will uh, look to see what kind of incentives maybe uh, we could consider at EU level for such an action. But it's, it's one of the tools that is missing, that, that's clear. So information, what should be planted, what should be restored, and then the tool seeds and everything else with it. And perhaps this could be um, a collaboration point between SEM Bureau and the EU um, Pollinator Initiative going forward. As, as this work stream develops, we can work with you to then be able to disseminate this information. I, I know this question has come up several times within the companies that I work with, and it's never a straightforward answer because it, it depends on geography um, and the species list differ between countries with even within countries depending on the substrate you're, you're working on so um yeah action point going forward perhaps thank you um right we have another uh, question in the q a um so this is looking at the uh the start of the quarry so this is this is asking have there been any studies uh which looks at how many pollinators have been negatively affected um during the opening of a quarry so um very much um how how the development of a quarry can affect pollinators and their habitats um not sure uh probably hasn't been a widely studied phenomenon uh, in the same way that the impacts of agriculture for example has been what is sure is that calcareous grassland habitats are uh, uh, a threatened habitat 
and are of high conservation importance. Um, so in areas where there's a limestone base, you're going to have a very potentially rich flowering plant community and associated insect community. So I suppose logically, if you went in and disrupted one of those sites through actual extraction, then um, yeah, there would be a loss of species. Um, but these habitats can be restored and are being restored as well. Um, and they have a level of protection as well in the European framework. Um, maybe Bridget could mention about that. But the, the short answer is, I don't know of any specific studies in a sort of global recognized way uh, that have looked at it. There may well be some out there that I just am uh, not aware of. Great, thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we better we better press on. So thank you so much to our, our keynotes. They were fantastic um, presentations and thank you so much for joining us. So now for the remaining part of the webinar, we're gonna focus on action on the ground, what's happening now. So what, what is going on in our sector? And we have two great studies, one from Cecil and one from Semex. So first of all, we will turn to Cecil. And I would now like to introduce Pedro Salguero, who's an invited assi assistant researcher at the University of Avora in Portugal. Um, Pedro holds a PhD in biology from the University of Avora, um, where his thesis developed on the effects of landscape fragmentation and connectivity on bird distribution. Pedro's area of research is centered around habitat loss and fragmentation and the impact that this has on species populations and interactions and coordinates the study and enhancement of biodiversity at Cecil's Wutukori. So Pedro, I'd very much like to hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, many thanks, Caroline, for the, the presentation. Um, and uh, many thanks for the invitation by, by Sam Bureau for being here show, showing our work. So as you said, uh, I'm, um, I'm part of a team that's working uh, on, a, on a project with Cecil uh, since 2007. And this is uh, part of, of one of our studies that, that we've been carrying out uh, at Cecil. And um, well, of course, it's about insect pollination services, and we basically compared actively and spontaneous uh, with natural reference sites. The, the title unfolds a little bit of the, the main results, but I will show you step by step what uh, what we've done to 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 reach these these uh, results. So, as you all know, uh, restoration is a process, and it's a process that takes a long time. Um, and there are several hurdles on the way until you find a fully functional uh, ecosystem. Some of them are abiotic barriers, some others are biotic barriers. And in the first stage, normally you focus on, on physical and chemical interventions like land forming, embankment, um, and soon you pass that, you, you start to caring about the, the, the life, the, namely through, through the, the vegetation of the sites, either being spontaneous or, or, or assisted. So, it's a biotic intervention that you, you make. Afterwards, you may require a target intervention, mainly to achieve a self-sustainable system. And that's what you're talking here today. It's about achieving self-sustainable systems through the installment of uh, ecological processes. So uh, that's what I'll be talking about, about this third part. But there's sometimes um, some confusion about what is function and where function uh where can we study function in, in in this gradient um so i normally say that composition precedes function because people normally focus on composition to achieve function and, and this as a corollary that is not very right that that says that a single endpoint exists to achieve self-sustainable system this is known as the carbon copy myth um and why this is not very true in, in my in my point of view because sometimes restoring or creating an ecosystem to a specific composition is very difficult. So we're talking about queries here, and queries change to the, the landform, and uh, through the soil, you may not always uh, achieve the, the, the natural ecosystem, but you can achieve function either way. So the question is, is if you don't achieve the, this composition, do you mean that uh, we can achieve a sustainable, uh, self-sustainable uh, system? Well, um, we focus on pollination. We focus on also other uh, studies on, on on ecological function, like seed dispersing. But this this one was about pollination. 
you already know from previous uh, presentations that most uh, wild plants rely on pollinators for production. And pollinators contribute to plant genetic diversity. This genetic diversity improves the, the, the quality of the seeds, improves the, 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 the fruits that are being dispersed afterwards. Uh, so pollinators will ultimately uh, increase ecosystem resilience. But we're talking about disturbed sites and pollinators are sensitive to anthropogenic disturbance. So in order to have an, an ecosystem that is resilient, we also have to overcome this anthropogenic disturbance to have pollinators uh, doing this, the, this work. So we focus on three areas, a natural area, a restored area, and a Madon area, and we compared basically uh, the community composition through uh, species similarity index, basically how much of the, the restore uh, of, of the pollinators in the restored area resembles the, the, the natural area, and also community function through ecological networks. Well, ecological networks are based on interactions. And uh, what is an interaction? Every time a bee visits one flower, um, there are pollen transfer from the flower to, to the bee. So this is an interaction. In this specific case of our study, we not only accounted for the, 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 the visits, but through the pollen that was transported by, by the animal. Uh, the pollinator may not only transport the, the, the pollen that uh, of the previous plant that he has visited, but all the plants that he has visited before also uh, go with, the, with the, the, the pollinator. So we can account the number of pollens and have an estimation for each plant uh, of the intensity of interaction between the pollinator and each of the plants. So first thing first, talking about some general figures, we had uh, 1,500 insects captured, 44% of them carried uh, pollen. Uh, of these, 5% were overflies or flies, another 5% for beetles, and bees uh, were the main part of this with 86%. 20% wild bees, 26% bumblebees, and 40% honeybees. So regarding community composition, we found that the, the, the restored area was only 40% similar to the natural area in terms of the, the, the pollinator community. The abandoned area uh, showed higher resemblance with the natural area achieving 50%. And in the plot up here, you can see that, for instance, in the natural area, we have a higher abundance of uh, honeybees and in the restored areas, a lower abundance of honeybees. Uh, but in this case, we have a higher abundance of wild bees. In the abandoned areas, we have a high abundance of honeybees and bumblebees and a lower abundance of uh, wild bees. So another fact that we concluded here is that there's an inverse relationship between honeybee and wild bee abundance. Whenever there's high abundance of honeybees, we have lower abundance of uh, wild bees and vice versa. So talking about community function, this is the aspect of um, an interaction network. You have on the upper level all the pollinator species and the lower level the plant species. Uh, every line that links the pollinator to a plant species, the width of that line uh, symbols the intensity of the, the, the interaction. So you can see, for example, for this honeybee that interacts a lot with this plant number six, which is rosemary. We have, of course, the interaction networks for all the, 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 the other areas, the restored area, the abandoned area, and you can already see some difference here. Uh, for example, the honeybees are uh, or have less intense um, interactions in the restored abandoned area, and on the other hand, mainly the restored area, you have much more wild bees uh, performing pollination services. So from these plots, of the, from these interaction networks, we can extract some metrics that uh, characterize this, uh, the, these interaction networks. I will not bother you with, with the, 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 the specifics of these, the, these metrics, but I, I want what I want you to show is for you to keep a track on the lines that will appear on the, on, on the screen, mainly the orange one, which symbolizes the abandoned area. And you will see that the orange one detaches a little bit more from the patterns from the blue and green uh, green lines, which symbolize natural and uh, and restored areas. We have also some differences 
uh, which are uh, symbolized with that star-like uh, character, uh, that show that there are more differences in terms of function uh, with the, the abandoned area than between the restored and the, the natural area. So some, some take home messages, some key, key messages is that, as you can see, we had composition and function working sideways. So uh, in terms of composition, uh, the, the, the abandoned area was more similar to the natural area, but in terms of function, we, the, restore, the restored area was more similar to, to the natural area. So this not always seems that we, we have to replicate the same uh, the same recipe, the same composition to have the, the, the function working in there. The, the thing is, in the restored area, we have more wild bees performing pollination work than the, 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 the any bees that work in the, the natural areas. So we, we can have distinct biological communities playing the same service and playing the same function uh, as found in the, in the reference ecosystems. On the other hand, we achieve function much rapidly uh, through active restoration. So uh, res restored areas were about 40 years, or so, no, 30 years, and uh, the abandoned areas were about 40, 40 years and were a little bit different. But in, in one advantage of the abandoned area is that they kept uh, the, 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 the pollination surface, uh, surface um, more stable a long time. And this was mainly due to rural opportunistic plants, like the, the Adam was saying, the weeds, uh, that buffered against the shortage of resources that happened in, in April in the natural and restored areas. And uh, a last fact is that um, honeybees may have, uh, through the swarming effect, they can dominate uh, the pollinator communities and that can, can have uh, an impact on wild bee communities that can be much less diverse. The, the the paper has been published, so if you if you want to see further details, you can consult the the, the, the paper or contact me, of course. So, just to end, um, now we're going to um, what what we're going to do now about pollination is to go special. What does that mean? You see in this map, this map represents the 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 Cecilotown, uh, area. You can see a darker uh, area in the center, which is the, the quarry, and you can see uh, several gradients. So the darker the blue is, the less service you have here. The, the lighter, the, the green and the, the, the yellow, more service, more ecosystem service you have here. Uh, so what you're trying to do is to uh, pinpoint in a map the sites uh, where we need to act directly to improve the service uh, on, on these restored areas. And uh, lastly, we're implementing um, a monitoring scheme, uh, which is a non-invasive method. Basically, we just count visitation uh, of the pollinator insects to, to the flowers. So here, the interaction is uh, a visitation of an insect to, 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 to a flower. Uh, and we're trying to implement this in a, in a long time scale. Um, and I think this, uh, and this is a challenge to Sam Bureau and the, the other partners to, to implement also a scheme on, the, on, the other, uh, on the other quarries that can be replicated in the same manner so you can compare our results throughout Europe. So this is what I had to show. Many thanks for the invitation and congrats for the initiative. Caroline, thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro, and, and thank you so much for, for the challenge as well. That was good good to put that to us. Time to go big, definitely. Um, we're going to move uh, directly on to um, our second case study, uh, which is Sean Casti from Semex. Um, Sean has worked in the construction materials industry for over 30 years, so great experience in the technical and operational fields. Um, he, he saw the light and retrained in environmental science, a very good move um, and since Sean has worked in the sustainability sector developing and implementing environmental management systems uh, before then specializing in biodiversity another very good move. Um, Sean now works as the European biodiversity manager overseeing the implementation of the company's biodiversity standard and more recently he's helped develop the nature positive approach for the global business um, but today Sean will focus very much on pollinators come down to site level and Sean, I will hand over to you. Okay. 
Um, thank you very much, Caroline. Um, and obviously, thanks very much to the speakers as well. It's been very interesting. And uh, good morning to everybody. So, um, given the time we've got left, I'll just... Uh, I won't. Um, <laughs> there it is. Uh, I'm trying to get it to. Where's that? Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, you have to excuse my uh, lack of technical expertise. Anyway, so what 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 we've got here is a quick presentation about what we do in terms of working with um, pollinators in in the UK. Um, and we've got a case study, it's um, two quarries in the UK, which is Kensworth and um, Southam. So, um, so these are um, two quarries which supply uh, cement works in rugby. So Kensworth is a, a quarry which is on a, a type of rock which is called chalk, and that's a source of calcium carbonate. So on that uh, on that type of uh, bedrock, you'll get uh, calcareous grassland habitats, and obviously, some of them is a source of um, silica, and obviously, you need those two 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 raw materials to make the cement, and um, that's what we do. But obviously, the two cement quarries then get restored um, to give some sort of background. The um, two quarries. Uh, initially were arable agriculture. So if you, if you look at the UK uh, as it's developed over the last um, the last you know 70, 80 years, the southeast corner of England has become um, intensely intensely um, agricultural. So the two quarries actually replaced agricultural land. Um, so the impact was probably less. If you uh, if you look at um, uh, what we're trying to do in terms of improving um, the habitats on site. One of the key things that we, we wanted to achieve was obviously to improve biodiversity and the way to do that, because we knew we had a lack of expertise within our business ourselves, was to start to develop partnerships. So these two quarries, we've developed partnerships um, with two different organisations. What you'll find at individual quarries, that is probably um, it's probably important to develop a partnership with an NGO that has a is concerned with that particular environment. So we we, we do concentrate on that. Um, what we've done is we've got a, a process whereby um, we work with different partners at different quarries and at different levels in the business. So at uh, Southam, which is the, the quarry which we're going to concentrate on, we work with an uh, NGO which is called Butterfly Conservation. So they're really interested in promoting um, butterflies and moths, but also they're interested more generally in pollinators. Um, so the habitats that they wanted to create on site, which is of interest to them, are those which obviously promote their, their objectives. And at Kensworth, it was working with another wildlife charity, the NGO. But we also have a, a long-term partnership with an organisation called the RFPB. So they have somebody embedded within the business. And um, so they work with us full-time. So I think um, the advantages of working with an NGO are that um, you get expertise. And if you look at um, the... Uh, senior management, if you look at the employees within the within a quarry, what you'll find is that we need to generally raise the level of competence. So if you think about the hierarchy of competence, what we're trying to do is in, improve the competence. By working closely with NGOs, you sort of develop those competencies within the business. And it's particularly important uh, for the people that work at the quarry level. So that's the site managers and the site operatives. So um, we've done that, and uh, so what we've done, working closely with the um, with the NGOs, is we've actually uh, worked with them to feed their knowledge, their expertise, their advice in, into what we do. 
So obviously as a, a business, the, the way we, we manage biodiversity at sites is we have what's called a biodiversity standard. And in that, you've got a, a set of stages which, um, which uh, you know, we go through to get what's called a biodiversity plan. And in there, we've got a key part of the process is, is developing partnerships. And that's what we've done um, at, at these two quarries. Um, we've done ecological impact assessment. So that's something we've worked at. We worked at with the NGOs. So we work on the biodiversity baseline. We look at the ecological impacts. And together we come up with a series of mitigation measures, but also enhancements that can improve the biodiversity. Um, <clears throat> so that worked um, really well. And for the site at Southam, we work very closely with uh, Mike Slater, who's renowned in the area. So what we do is the site manager and myself, and obviously um, Butterfly Conservation, but also the RSPB, have a series of um, targets that we have to have to work on. And we have a time scale and who takes responsibility. So it's not just CEMEX operating. It, this is a, um, a joint commitment from all of us. Uh, we've also um, got a legal obligation to produce restoration plans. So as part of the process of working with NGOs, what we do, and here you can see the restoration plan for Kensworth Quarry, we've worked very closely with the RSPB. We've got a requirement for um, something called biodiversity net gain. So we're trying to demonstrate to the regulator that we've improved biodiversity. So that's what we've done. Um, and we've gone from a restoration scheme that was predominantly agricultural to one which has now got a number of different habitats. And, then, and, and for this one, we've increased the, the area of uh, pollinator habitat quite substantially. So we're going to create over 100 hectares of, um, of chalk grassland, which is essential for pollinators. So um, in terms of success, I'll just cover it very quickly. Um, Sorry, I'm going too fast. Sorry, but them, um working with um, uh, butterfly conservation, we've been able to develop about fifty hectares of calcareous grassland, but that's mixed with other habitats as too. And as as we've already been discussed, we've also allowed other areas to regenerate, and there's some areas of um, scrub, there's some areas of woodland, and obviously we've got. Um, exposed cliff faces and wetlands. So it actually becomes a, a mosaic. And what we find is that's um, really good for biodiversity more generally. But once you've got an established calcareous grassland habitat, what we find is that if we we can we can put flowers in them, we've, we've obviously sown kidney vetch there for a species of butterfly called small blue, which is very rare in the UK. And it's been a big success working with butterfly conservation. Um, and that's uh, that, that's obviously seen 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 benefits because we get a wide range of pollinators on site. Um, so that's been a success. A very similar sort of thing at um, Kensworth, where we've seen um, we used uh, working with the Wildlife Trust. We planted cowslip, and one of the rarest species of butterfly in the UK is the Duke of Burgundy. So working with um, volunteers from the um from the wildlife trust uh, carefully sawed um the cowslip season we've obviously seen the return of the duke of burgundy which is obviously quite rare so it's really good um, that we've done and we've also been able to convert that into a, a nature reserve so in terms of uh, how we how we monitor things and obviously um going forward um we we, we work very closely with the ngos in terms of um, working out the habitat, but we've also created a mapping tool and we've got records there. And obviously, in the in the UK, we've got a project called Nature After Minerals, which is helping the industry map its habitats, and that's actually very important because we can then go on to show the net impact of a site. So we can look at the site before it was developed. This is all one of the questions that came up: where we are today, and where we'll get to in the future. Like I said, for these two sites, um, it was uh, a case of taking agricultural land and turning it into, um, you know, the restoration includes turning it into a more natural um, priority habitat. 
So that's um, that's what we've got. So we've got some good good results. So the net impact is positive, um, and it's obviously been very beneficial to uh, for pollinators. So uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just I'll just I'll end it there. So um, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sean. They are some beautiful habitats that you're creating, and it's so good that we can um, that we can use the net impact assessment to show that show that change from the agricultural landscape to the um, niche conservation landscape. Um, really, really good. Thank you so much. Um, we are coming to the end. Um, we've had some questions in the Q and A, and thank you so much for the speakers for um, answering directly into that. Um, otherwise, to bring it to a close. Um, I personally want to thank all the speakers and to those people that attended, um, but I will hand over uh, to Nikos who will give um, a, a final closing. Nikos, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Kaz. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Uh, so also uh, many thanks from my side. Um, it has been an, an excellent, uh, uh, nice webinar. I'm very happy that uh, uh, we have organized the same bureau. Uh, I would like also quickly from my side, not to take a lot of time, to thank the speakers and the participants. Uh, it has been great to hear from uh, Adam about how pollinators affect our lives after all. Uh, from uh, Vujadin, the actions by the European Commission, uh, also from Son and from Pedro, the specific uh, uh, actions that have been taken by the cement industry. Uh, also the participants, I think it was an interactive session. There were interesting questions and uh, also some uh, actions that could be followed up. Uh, I would like to thank, to thank also uh, Bade Kizilaslan, our same Bureau Communication Manager, who has been behind the scenes working for the organization of, uh, of our webinar. And uh, to let you know that uh, as Alexandra mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is part of our same Bureau's roadmap for the biodiversity. Uh, we are planning for more webinars for different topics and for uh, other actions as well. Uh, so uh, please stay tuned in our uh, same Bureau social media on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Uh, we are also planning to launch a podcast series in the, in the coming um, uh, weeks. So uh, we'll be happy. Uh, to have you more uh, on board and uh, in in uh, more uh, webinars that we are going to organize. So the floor back to you, Kaz, and uh, thank you for your excellent moderation today. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Um, just quickly, um, Pedro mentioned a paper uh, which looked very, very interesting in his presentation. I have just posted a link to that in uh, in the chat so everybody can, and can access it. Thank you very much, Pedro. So. 10, well, 11.30 on the dots, 10.30 for me. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, I hope you feel suitably inspired, suitably enthused, um, and, and you're ready to go out and take inspiration from what we've heard today and uh, implement some actions in in around your quarries, your plants, at home, wherever pollinators need us, and the challenge is over to you. So thank you so much um, and look forward to, to seeing you at another webinar or, or around the biodiversity and business circle. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>